they're sleeping. I don't know exactly where they are, but I know they're here, just snuggling down under the leaf litter, waiting for it to warm up a bit. I'm here in the beautiful Brampton Wood, the home of a very special little animal. It's a rodent which has shed the negative connotations that usually come with rats and mice, and it seals the heart of anyone who sees it. If you haven't guessed yet, I am of course talking about the Dormouse. Nestled in the heart of Cambridgeshire, Brampton Wood has been a significant focal point for surrounding communities for over 900 years. It was even mentioned in the Doomsday Book. In 1993, Brampton Wood gained new significance when it became the site of the UK's first ever official Dormouse reintroduction project, carried out by the People's Trust for Endangered Species. And still to this day, because of an ongoing monitoring programme by the Wildlife Trust for Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire and Northamptonshire, we know that right now there are dormice hibernating in these woods. After all, we couldn't call them dormice if they didn't sleep a lot of the time. The door in Dormouse comes from the French for sleep, cementing their reputation as lazy little so-and-sos. But really, they're not lazy. They're perfectly adapted to a seasonal temperate climate, and their long winter sleeps are a great way to survive the chilly period when there's not much food around. Many people watching this will probably never have seen a Dormouse in the flesh, and neither have I, but over the next few months I'm hoping to get lucky because I'm going to be following the people who work so hard to keep the Dormouse thriving in this wood, the people who maintain the habitat, the people who monitor it on the ground, and the people who crunch that all-important ecological data. So come with me and meet the Dormouse Dream Team of Brampton Wood. The sites that I could choose to discover more about Dormice are unfortunately few and far between. Dormouse numbers have been declining for at least 100 years, and since 2000, they are thought to have decreased by 38%. Luckily, thanks to the Dormouse reintroduction in 1993, Brampton is bucking that trend. The People's Trust for Endangered Species were looking for suitable sites where they might be able to thrive. Brampton seemed like a good place. It's one of Cambridge's largest areas of ancient woodland. It's got loads of trees and shrubs that'd be good for Dormouse food. Sounds like plain sailing, right? Well, not so much because Dormouse reintroductions are a delicate business. So assuming that you've got your location, where does the reintroduction programme go from there? After Dormouse are coming out of hibernation, the, there's a meeting of the, the captive breeders. All those Dormouse are then brought to, to that meeting and then from there they're separated out um, to go into quarantine. Then after six weeks, and it's usually about towards the end of June, though the Dormice are then taken up to the woodland that's been selected. In the time they've been in quarantine, the volunteers have been out, they've put up some soft release cages in the, in, attached to the trees. Dormice are paired up, put in those cages, um, and then they're left there for 10 days to, for, so they get used to the sounds and noises of the woodland. Um, during that time, they're obviously provided food on a daily basis and they're given water. After 10 days, a small ho hole is opened in the cage and the dormice are then free to kind of come and go. That's amazing, but it's a really long process. So are there any risks involved that it just might not work after all that? Yeah, there's always risks in these things. It can fail at a number of, number of reasons. One is, is for whatever reason, we might have not enough dormice come out, so uh, we don't have enough dormice to put into the woodland. Um, it might be that the uh, people that manage the woodland, they haven't managed their volunteers very well, uh, or it could just be that we have a poor year and we have poor weather and the dormice simply don't survive. But probably the, the biggest negative thing is actually if, if the woodland management work isn't undertaken for any reason, that seems to have the most negative impact on the long-term survival of the dormice population. Woodland management is so important because dormice rarely come down to the ground. They move around using interconnecting branches from trees and shrubs, so if these are lost there's no way of them getting around to find shelter or food. And speaking of food, a very dander story provides a rich diet containing some of their favourite foods like hazelnuts and blackberries. We're standing in the middle of a ride surrounded by amazing wildflower patches, but I'm guessing that it doesn't naturally look like this. So what do you do? So this area is actively managed. If we just left this to its own devices, it would turn into woodland. We have to keep it mown short, but we can't mow it all short because the wildlife doesn't appreciate it. So we regularly mow the center um, and that's for access. And then we leave longer areas to the side, um, but we don't cut them all in one year. We actually cut one side one year and then the other side the other year. 
and that gives us a range of different habitat height and within that there's different wildflowers and also gives somewhere for the invertebrates to overwinter. But then outside of that we've got early successional phase and it's where the coppice occurs of hazel and ash and blackthorn but that's done on an eight year cycle. This area is done this year, another one next door, another one on the opposite side a bit further down. But anything that appreciates that yearly young growth um, and that's really where you get the brambles coming through which are quite easily shaded out over time. Well, we've only walked a few metres and it already looks so different. So what's yeah. going on here? This area here, we're now coming through into a, the coppice cycle. So we're stood amongst four five-year-old hazel stems and it's on an eight-year cycle. So it'll be cut within the next three or four years. This area offers a different habitat type. The benefits that we get from this short phase is that we get a lot of this young growth coming seven, eight foot tall in a few years brambles occurring right the way through it and the but as the hazel gets older seven eight years it starts to produce hazelnuts and that is obviously a food source for dormice to fatten up for the winter months as that hazel gets older and more mature then it's it's more likely to support uh, the hazel dormice within the sort of stems itself and behind all this i can see there are some really big trees so what's yeah. going to happen over there this is a much longer phase of management within the wood that's on a 20 to 25 year cycle. That will be higher forest, um, but not big mature trees. So there's some beautiful old specimens within the wood. But this young growth here, it's done on a shorter phase and that supports a different range of habitat opportunities for many different species. By keeping this sort of diverse mosaic of different age structures across the wood, it really does benefit the different biodiversity levels. As I learnt from Aidan, a huge amount of work goes into maintaining this woodland for biodiversity, including, of course, the dormouse. But is it just enough to create the habitats and hope for the best? Well, the Wildlife Trust don't think so, because they also have a thorough monitoring programme to track the dormouse population. They do this by putting these boxes out around the wood, 200 of them in total. And it might just look like a few pieces of wood nailed together, but they're a really good place for dormice to rest and have their young during the summer. And they're actually really specialised. This box is called the Brampton because it was invented right here. And its special features include a hole underneath rather than round the back, which is great for drainage if it's been very rainy, and this special piece of mesh, which means that you can have a look at what's inside before you open it up. But so many of these boxes around the wood and then being so specialised that you're not going to find it in the supermarkets. Where do they get them all from? Well, yet again, the trust gets by with a little help from their friends. And in this case, I'm talking about a team of volunteers who are box making extraordinaires. But don't think that all these volunteers must be DIY fanatics. Some of them are school children. And we know that schools have so much to fit into the curriculum. So why did you decide to partner with the Wildlife Trust and do this? So it's a really fantastic opportunity for us to work with a local wildlife charity. Um, and it's really great in that the project ties in very, very nicely with our curriculum. So there are woodworking skills there, there are measuring skills, a little bit of maths. So we can really incorporate this great community project with our curriculum, it ties in very well. So once these boxes have been finished, they're spaced out around the wood, ready to be used for dormice to make their nests. And then the Wildlife Trust checks them every year to monitor the population. It's an important part of checking that this woodland continues to be good for these fuzzy little icons. I found you in the midst of a load of activity because your volunteers have just turned up for your first survey of the year. But I know that this isn't the only thing you do. So can you talk me through a year in the life of the monitoring programme? So the dormouse monitoring year actually starts in the winter while the dormice are still asleep hibernating. And during that time we go around and do a box check. So we go up around all our boxes. Any are damaged, we replace them with nice new boxes. And then we also clear out the old boxes. So if there's any debris or old nests from last year just to make them nice and clean and inviting for when the dormice wake up. Fast forward to summer, so we're starting the surveys now in May uh, and we'll do monthly box checks from now until October. Um, we just go around all the boxes recording where we find dormice, where we find the nests, any other animals we find. Your diary is absolutely packed, <laughs> but I imagine that even with the best planning in the world, there are difficulties. So what would you say is the hardest thing about the programme? One of the hardest things about monitoring dormice is that you pick up quite a low number of the animals that are actually present. 
So they live at quite low population density to start with. And then also we're only picking them up when they're actually using the boxes. So there may be lots of dormice that are using natural nesting sites around the wood. This all sounds like a huge amount of work <laughs> for a species that a lot of people will never see. So why do you care so much about the dormice? Dormice are a really important species. They're what we call an indicator species. So that means when we have dormice, it's an indicator that our woodlands are for really good habitat quality. So they're very much habitat specialists. They need a wide range of food plants. They also need really good habitat structure. So it's just an indicator that our woodland's really good for dormice. It'll also be really good for a wide range of other species. Would you be happy to take me out onto the reserve with your survey party and hopefully we can see one? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Fingers crossed we'll find one. At every survey, Gwen is joined by a vital team of volunteers. With 200 boxes in the wood that need to be checked, people power is key. Dormice are protected by law, meaning that it is illegal to harm or disturb dormice in their nests. So each volunteer survey group needs at least one licensed handler in their midst. Training for a license can take years because a candidate needs to prove to two existing license holders that they are competent to handle and survey dormice at every life stage before they're recommended for their license. As well as learning how to safely handle dormice, they need to learn how to collect biological data about them, which is vital for the monitoring scheme as it shows the health of the population. I followed Gwen and her crack team of volunteers around the wood, carefully checking each box in our section. Come rain or shine, the teams complete their checks. And this being the UK, we experienced just about every type of weather in one session. After checking 50 boxes, we had found nothing but a few empty nests most left long ago by birds, but one containing a trio of fragile wren chicks, and another still occupied by an angry hornet. But suddenly, our luck changed. This is really exciting. We just had a call from another volunteer group in the wood saying that they found a dormouse in the nest. So we're gonna run along and see if we can get there in time. This lucky team found a dormouse in one of their boxes. So it's time to carefully process it and collect that important data. First, the dormouse is gently held while the license handler checks their sex, age and breeding status. We can tell that this one is an adult female with no signs of being pregnant or with babies. She's weighed in one of these bags, which gives a good indication of her health. This individual is nice and heavy, meaning that she's managing to find a good amount of food in the wood, just what we want to see. The data won't just be used to determine the health of the dormice at Brampton. It's also submitted to the National Dormouse Monitoring Programme, run by the People's Trust for Endangered Species, so that they can build a picture of dormouse health nationwide. When I embarked on this journey at Brampton, I knew there was a chance that I wouldn't see a dormouse at all. After all, they're shy, they're secretive, and like all good things in life, they're very hard to predict which is why seeing my first dormouse today was so exciting. As a scientist, I understand why the dormouse is such an important indicator species. If we lose the dormouse from our woodlands, we lose a lot more besides. But just on a human level, seeing the dormouse today was so moving. I can completely see why it's love at first sight for so many people. And having met the volunteers who spend so much of the year looking after these little creatures, I thought it was only right to hand over the end of the film to them, to ask them why they do what they do. I volunteer here because I've been coming in here since I was a kid, and by volunteering on a do dormouse project, you get the chance to see a creature that you would otherwise never see in the wild. I'm doing my bronze DV, and this is a great experience. Lovely just being out in a natural environment, and then of course, you've got the dormouse themselves. It is sometimes like a little bit searching for needle in a haystack. We don't always find dormouse, but when we do, you've got the thrill of finding what is actually quite a rare endangered species. I love what the Wildlife Trust do. I love dormouse, and it's an opportunity to get out and do my bit. I love nature, and nature is really important to me and to all of us. But despite that, wildlife populations have more than halved in my lifetime. That's why the work that the Wildlife Trust does to protect places like this is so important. I'm a Key Stage 1 teacher, so um, it's lovely to get outdoors and do something different. I was also diagnosed with breast cancer three years ago, and actually doing this sort of thing was my sanity and helped me to recover and has kept me really positive. 